morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay in the back? Great. Good morning. Thank you so much for attending this session this morning. It's been a really great conference so far, and I am very honored to be able to present to you today. Again, my name is Rebecca. I'm a social worker by training, and I work at the Harborview Center for Sexual Assault and Traumatic Stress in Seattle, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my program in a minute. Um, today's presentation is called Community Mobilization Strategies Making Community Level Change. So I'll be talking about community, de community development as one strategy or one method uh, that is used for community mobilization. I do have a handout, it's just one page, hopefully that you found that on your seat. If not, I do have several more up here at the front if you need them. And I also have a copy of the PowerPoint on the NSAC website. You'll notice that the version that I have here is a little bit different than what you found online. I did add several more slides, uh, including a lot of pictures of the youth who I worked with who are, you're not going to find on the online version. <clears throat> I think, I don't usually do this, I'm used, used to presenting to a much smaller group, so I think just for today I'm going to ask you to hold questions until the end just for the sake of time and the large number of people. So feel free to hold your questions and I will definitely uh, make a big effort to allow time at the end for those and I'll also be happy to stay afterwards and talk to people. So I want to explain my bird theme here. <laughs> Uh, so you'll notice that I've got birds on my slides, and I don't know if anyone watches Portlandia. There's a whole episode about birds. Uh, but uh, the reason, I, I, first of all, I just love this image, but it just reminded me of the power of community and about, you know, the way that birds often travel in flocks. Not all breeds, but many breeds do. And that idea of, you know, the breed providing safety and numbers and also more efficient foraging, but also uh, more aerodynamic efficiency. And it just kind of reminded me of, you know, working together as, you know, a community is going to be much more effective at creating change and accomplishing things than, you know, working as individuals in silos. There's also this level of kind of variation between breeds. So some have, you know, it's kind of random, very democratic. One bird moves, everybody else moves. Uh, others, you know, there's a clear leader, you see the geese that fly, you know, kind of in a V shape. And so that's kind of how community development is too. Like you could have a really strong leader who's kind of leading it, or you could have it be more kind of equal, egalitarian, democratic. And so that, to me, made a nice analogy for community de development. So even though this work, working with communities, as you know, is very unpredictable and it's intended to be organic by nature, um, today I'm going to be presenting to you the model that is actually pretty structured and it's also something that could really be easily replicated, I think, in any, any community. So here are my objectives for the session. I'm hoping that everyone will gain skills in facilitating the steps of the community development process and learn at least one new strategy for each step. I hope that you gain an understanding of how to expand a project that you're doing in, a, in your local community to influence more community level change. And I'm also hoping that you gain skills uh, in ensuring community stakeholders lead the process while at the same time kind of guiding them in best practice and research-based uh, methods. And I'm going to present the model. I'm going to present some lessons learned and some things that I think are helpful in the process. And then I'm also going to be using a project that I just completed as a case example. So I just wrapped up a three-year project that was funded by RPE, and it was specifically on community development. And I worked in one specific high school. It was a kind of a, a rural setting, very, very small high school. And so I'm going to be sharing that project over the last three years as an example to demonstrate community mobilization. So a little bit more about my program. We are, our main office is located in Seattle, Washington, and we have other offices in Redmond, Shoreline, and Bellevue, for those of you who know King County. And we are basically, in our state, what we call a community uh, sexual assault program. Other states, I think, call them rape crisis centers. And we uh, provide comprehensive services our main service would be uh, trauma-focused counseling. We also provide medical exams for survivors. We also have a 24-hour hotline. We do advocacy, and then I'm the 
sole prevention education person there. So the work of community development is very much, and my work in prevention is very much rooted in theory. I'm not going to go into these too much, because I'm sure most people are familiar with these, but online I also provided a little handout with more information on a lot of these theories, but basically kind of sum it up. The work is very focused on primary prevention, so that whole analogy of swimming upstream and not just kind of focusing on, you know, helping survivors or holding perpetrators accountable, but really swimming upstream to kind of look at root causes of why sexual violence happens in the first place and how to change norms and the culture and contributing factors that lead to sexual violence in the first place. Also very much focused on preventing perpetration, but also can be preventing victimization as well. The social ecological model is some, also something that guides the work. So social ecological model is that idea that basically sexual violence doesn't happen in a, in a bubble. It's not like one person just making a bad choice. It happens in the context of this person's relationships, like where did they kind of learn their behaviors. They were raised within the context of a family and a school and a community and under kind of societal uh, norms and uh, government policies and laws. So influencing and prevention, you know, all levels of the social ecology is kind of the most effective prevention. Also guided by the nine principles of prevention, which gives us a lot of great guidelines on good prevention. So for instance, the work that we do should be soci socio-culturally relevant. It should be, you know, we should be doing more than a one-time presentation, you know, multiple sessions. Uh, we should be looking at evaluation and outcome, which I'm gonna spend a lot of time today talking about that. <clears throat> Social norms theory, I attended a great session yesterday on this. And uh, this is the idea that people are, again, these behaviors and attitudes and beliefs don't come out of, you know, just a person's kind of innate, you know, they're, they're born with these behaviors or attitudes. They're raised in this culture and in our society where they are very highly influenced by things around them, such as peers, family members, media. And so looking at changing wider uh, norms in a community is also going to be more effective at making lasting change. And then lastly, the public health model, which we've adopted a lot of techniques from the public health approaches, and one of those being kind of looking at what the risk factors are and the protective factors that lead to sexual assault. And I totally nerded out and made a social ecological model, and then I inserted the CDC's risk factors and protective factors onto the social ecological model. And this really guides my work. I have a picture of this at my office, and I kind of look at it and refer to it all the time. I also like to share this research with stakeholders. So working with high school students, I shared with them this research. And I think that it's very interesting for people to look at, you know, th this is actually what's shown, you know, by people who are really smart, who know uh, what are some of the contributing factors that lead to this happening in the first place. And what you also notice in doing community work is that they're going to have some of these risk factors as well and protective factors, but there are also going to be many other risk factors or root causes or underlying causes that the community members will come up with themselves that may have nothing to do with the CDC's research. So, for example, let's say you're working in a school that serves, you know, sixth graders up to high schoolers or beyond. The, the school that I worked at actually served up to, to, to up to 21. So that might be a risk factor because you've got kids of varying ages really kind of intermingling uh, quite a bit more than kind of your average school. So maybe that would be an example of a community specific risk factor underlying issue. But again, the community in this model are going to identify those themselves, what those are. <clears throat> Another thing I think that the social ecological model helps us with is, is coming up with strategies if we're thinking about being really comprehensive, thinking about what solutions or what, what prevention plans are going to address each of these levels. So just to give you an example, using this model or this research, you know, a prevention strategy or a prevention program that might address individual level risk factors might be helping youth to challenge gender stereotypes that they've internalized. So helping them kind of learn to challenge those. Uh, relationship factors might, a good prevention program might teach youth consent skills or communication skills in relationships or with their family. Um, a community level 
approach might be a media campaign that addresses kind of changing some of the social norms of the school or the community. And then a societal or sometimes I call it institutional level uh, approach or program might kind of go after changing policies or making sure that the school administration really incorporates youth voice into decision making. Okay, so again today I'm going to be focusing on community development, which is again one strategy that I think is wonderful for uh, doing community mobilization work. And our state several years ago adopted this as an actual standard. So this was one of the standards in our state that we were required to do with communities. And it in, I'm gonna go through the steps with you today, but basically kind of an overview of kind of what it looks like is it's something where the community is really driving the process. So you are the prevention, or I am the prevention staff going into a community. Oftentimes I'm not part of that community, I'm an outsider. And you're really looking at the community to kind of come up with the ideas, really drive the process. It's also a process that really looks at root causes, not just symptoms, not just looking at what they're seeing day to day in behaviors, but looking at kind of taking a couple steps back. Why is that happening specifically in your community? What are the root causes? And then addressing a plan to, it, to uh, change those. The process usually, I, the way I explain it, it has seven steps. I do realize on my handout it has eight steps. <laughs> and uh, that is because it depends on if you count number one as part of the steps. So number one is establishing relationships within communities. Well, first of all, it's defining your community, right? Defining who the, who the community is that you're going to work with. And then establishing relationships within those. In, in make, ensuring that you include marginalized uh, members in your process. And so that's step one. But if you don't count that as one of the steps, it's basically a seven step process. And so that's how I'll present it today, even though on the handout looks a little bit different. And also the ultimate goal is to shift the ownership to the community. So ultimately the project, the efforts, the changes will continue after you're gone, right? They're not relying on you as the thread that kind of holds it all together. They are taking ownership of the process themselves. This process was originally defined by William Losquist, and he published a book called The Technology of Development. And then our state, we had a couple prevention leaders in our state, uh, Gail Stringer and Lydia Guy, who both worked at our state coalition, who then looked at this process and adapted it for sexual assault. This is actually a process that can be used in lots of different realms it can be used to address lots of social issues. So such as, you know, I actually did a project in graduate school where I was a research assistant on a study that actually used the same process to address drug and alcohol use among youth in uh, kind of medium-sized uh, towns and cities. And so this can be used to kind of address any issue of concern for a community. And I will acknowledge first and foremost for those of you especially that are thinking, how am I ever gonna be able to do this? Uh, that this is, this, this strategy does take a lot of work and it does take a lot of time and it does take a lot of money. And so even though I do think this might be a lot more work than let's say going into a health class one time and presenting a session, which let me tell you, I do a lot of that too, but this is gonna be a lot more effective at making lasting change and really shifting ownership to a community and really making kind of meaningful uh, kind of systemic changes, more community level change to a, to a community. So I also think that this, this approach is by nature very uh, kind of inclusive of a lot of different uh, people and viewpoints. Uh, it's very much meant to include the diversity of the community and it's really really critical that people from marginalized identities and communities are included in the process i think a lot of our systems and programs and services and sexual assault we you know historically were based on kind of white mainstream uh, 
viewpoints. And so it's really important in doing this work that it's very inclusive of everyone. And therefore, your solutions that are generated will actually be a lot more relevant to various groups of people. So here is kind of step zero of the process. Step zero is really defining your community. Who are you going to work with? And I think it is natural, and I've seen this a lot with people, with colleagues and including myself, where your initial kind of idea is to go big, right? I want to change the culture in all of Washington State or all of King County. And that is very challenging to do that, right? To take on a gigantic community where there's so many different things going on and so many different factors that it's just basically, long story short, I don't think we're there yet in our field. And I hope that we do, or at least I can just speak for myself, I hope that my work does move in that direction, and I feel like it has over the years. But I think it's really, really good to start small. And that is what I have learned from, from the beginning in doing this work, where your community, and for those of you, whoops, whoa, sorry. For those of you who are maybe more at a county level or a state level, maybe you are already doing kind of this large community type work. I think that's a lot more challenging or dealing with a lot more systems. So maybe the larger community might be your whole entire state or your whole county or your whole school district. But I want you to also know with this strategy, community development, you can define community however you want. And so that could really be more an individual school. It could even be an individual classroom. It could be a faith community. It could be a small neighborhood. It could be one block of a neighborhood. So <laughs> you don't need to always think big, and I think some of you in the room probably are doing this level of work. For me, I have found it to be more effective, especially making community level change to kind of start small. And so sometimes those projects do end up getting big. So sometimes you might be like uh, about maybe seven years ago, I did uh, some skill building education with a classroom, one classroom at a school for children with developmental disabilities. And that ended up turning into where a parent observed that class and then that parent ended up working for the school district. And then they brought me in to kind of, uh, basically long story short, they then implemented sexual abuse prevention into the entire special education department of that school district. So sometimes you're just in a little classroom and that ends up turning out to be something big. So the, the school of focus that I'm going to talk about today was this one specific project that I did in North Bend, Washington. Has anyone ever heard of North Bend? Okay, a few people. All right, so North Bend is a, a town. Let's see, I have the population here. Population about 4,500. And it's in the foothills of the Snoqualmie Mountains. So it's about 35 miles east of Seattle. And this was the community that I chose to work with. And part of the reason why is because I had some pre-existing relationships there, which are also really key to having a successful project, is you want to have some people there, or at least one person there, who you know. And you, I had gone there for several years doing, again, some skill building curriculum, working with kids on healthy relationships and healthy sexuality uh, sessions. And I just got a really good feel from this school being very open to talking about uh, a wide range of issues, and I think some of that is because they're an alternative school. So they're considered a school of choice where um, any student can go there, especially those who feel like maybe they, the kind of mainstream huge high school that's out there would not be a good fit for them. So this is a school district that serves three towns, Snoqualmie, North Bend, and Fall City. And they do have one very, very large high school out there. And a lot of the kids who go to this school, which is called Two Rivers, pictured here, and you can see Mount Si in the background, very beautiful out there. Uh, they, a lot of the kids have felt uh, that, that Mount Si High School would not be a good fit for them. And actually several reported that they just didn't feel safe going there. And so this is kind of an alternative to that school and it's very, very small. There's only about 100 students who go here and it is middle school and high school. And because it's an alternative school, you also tend to get some kids who are a little bit older, who are 18, 19, they call themselves super seniors. And so that's, that's kind of the culture of the school. And this school does kind of specialize in serving, there's a lot of underserved population and marginalized students. Like I said, a lot of students who've kind of been through a lot. Uh, there's, uh, I was really surprised actually how many students I work with 
also worked full-time jobs. Uh, a lot of kids who I worked with were homeless. Uh, a lot of LGBT uh, uh, folks in this school. Not a lot of racial diversity, just kind of in this community in general. Um, but again, a wide range of ages, a lot of kids. There's a child care on site for teen parents. Uh, a lot of kids who have, again, felt that a mainstream kind of educational system is not going to be a good fit for them. So I worked with a lot of kids who had kind of significant mental health issues and had a lot of kids who had survived some kind of traumatic event already. <clears throat> so here, if you look at it as a seven step process, after you define your community and you have built some relationships there, so I had this relationship just with the school counselor, uh, then this is the process that kind of unfolds with the community. So it's a seven step process. I'm gonna go through each one in detail. So it starts with recruiting stakeholders, asking them why does this social issue happen here? In this case, it's sexual violence, but again, you can apply any social issue to this. Could be bullying, could be drug and alcohol use. What would the community look like without sexual violence? And then how can we get from where we are at now to where we wanna be? So kind of point A to point B. And then we're gonna make a prevention plan. We're gonna to talk to the stakeholders about how we're gonna measure our success, how are we gonna evaluate. Then we're going to carry out our prevention plan and we're going to then evaluate what we have done and make revisions to the plan and create change. So the first step would be working with stakeholders and these are just a couple uh, take home messages that I have kind of learned from doing this process. So with recruitment, you want to identify some people in the community who are really going to be pivotal in the community, who have a lot of social capital, who maybe are the ones to make decisions, but also the ones that maybe are kind of well-liked or have a lot of social influence. I personally like to work with youth who a lot of people wouldn't think of them as a traditional leader. Uh, in this project, we actually just allowed students to self-identify as leaders if they thought of themselves as a leader, and they could join our project. So we didn't have a really intensive recruitment process. It was really much self, very much self-selection. But really, you, you do want to ensure that you have diversity on, in your stakeholders as much as you can. And that might be even once you kind of start the process, really make, make, you know, asking the community who is not here and then pointing out who you see might, not, might, might be missing from the table. And in my project that I'm going to present on today at Two Rivers School, I consider the youth as the stakeholders, so the, the leadership, the youth who considered themselves leaders were the stakeholders, but I also had a few key adult stakeholders too, and that's going to be really critical. So even when you're doing youth-based work that's very much youth-driven, youth empowerment, you still want to have a couple really good adult stakeholders because they're the ones that are kind of gatekeepers with the whole process. So we did get the school counselor on board, the uh, leadership teacher, and the principal, and it started with uh, an actual meeting with the three of them and myself to kind of talk ab to them about what I wanted to do, what my grant was kind of proposing, and if they felt this would be a good fit for their school. They were very enthusiastic, and I was very pleased that they actually integrated this into the school day. So I was very lucky to have an actual class that was devoted to this project. I've also done projects like this in after-school clubs or lunchtime lunchtime clubs and you can do it it's just a lot more challenging because you get different kids kind of every day and it kind of feels like school sometimes <laughs> so you have to make it really fun if you're doing it an after school club like you have to play a lot of games uh, even in the class we still played a lot of games so recruitment's key now uh, I'll talk at the very end I have a new project that's going to be starting up where I'm going to be in a much larger high school now and recruitment is going to be more necessary in a larger community because you might want to do announcements you might want to post things in, in social media you might want to put posters up kind of announcing the project and recruiting stakeholders uh, let's see you also Want, uh, one of my colleagues I thought had a great idea, which I'm going to try for my next project, which is if you're already in the school doing some guest speaking or going in and presenting some sessions, maybe in the health class, identifying kids that kind of get it uh, in the crowd. So kids that, you know, there was a kid recently at this high school, little ninth grader that said, you know, that's an example of rape culture. And I was like, I need you in the project. I need your name. Uh, 
So kids like that, where you feel like you know they're they're not afraid to speak up when you're in there talking about sensitive issues, and they seem really passionate, or uh, you know maybe they have other assets that you think would be great to the project, um, and so recruiting those kids when you kind of meet them in other settings is also a great recruitment technique. <clears throat> so as far as assessment of readiness. You want to talk to the community pretty openly about what the concerns are. One thing that I've noticed in doing this work over the years is sometimes you come into a community and you realize that there's been a major incident that has occurred already that you didn't really know about, or they've been in the news, or uh, they have some specific concerns or there's an underlying reason of why they invited you in. And so you want to be aware of kind of what the concerns are. Who are the gatekeepers? Who are the people that might be barriers to your project? What assets and strengths do you already have going on in your, in your community? What kind of awareness? Do you think people are, are aware of this issue already? Are people afraid to say the word rape? Are people afraid to say sexual assault? And I've been in districts where it's really hard to say anything related to sex, anything. And so you want to kind of get a feeling of what the culture and climate is in that community that you're working in. On, uh, our state has now adopted more officially kind of an assessment of readiness tool that we'll all be using for the first time. So I just wanted to let people know about that. It's called the Community Readiness Model, and it's produced by the Tri-Ethnic Center. And it's actually free online. You can Google that, and that gives you kind of a more formal uh, kind of stepped process that you can go to and assess a community by interviewing kind of key people in the community. Uh, and identifying barriers. One thing I learned really quickly at Two Rivers was transportation was a major issue. Uh, just to give you a kind of a case example, I heard kids were walking five miles to get to school. I would be driving there because I live in Seattle and I would see them walking from major distances and I'm, I'm not authorized, we're not allowed to give students rides. And um, I learned very quickly that the whole public bus system had been cut out there. And so, and again, kind of being an outsider to the community, I wouldn't really know this unless I'd heard kind of people talking about it. And so I decided to go to, there was a community meeting on the transportation issue. And so I just decided to go to just kind of inform myself on what was happening in the community and why was this transportation such an issue. And another problem is the school district wouldn't provide the kids transportation because a lot of them had chosen an alternate schedule because that's what worked for them. And like I said, a lot of the kids I work with had kind of major anxiety. Uh, you know, it was just not successful for them to start school at seven in the morning. So a lot of the kids started school more at nine, nine thirty. Well, if you do that by choice, which ninety percent of the kids do, the school district will not provide you a bus. And so, again, it were kind of relying on parents, and many of my, the kids that I worked with didn't have parents, you know. Some, several of them were homeless or kind of estranged from their families. And so we came up with this really creative way where there was a local nonprofit that was providing transportation. And there was actually a policy that said they couldn't provide transportation to school, but they could provide transportation to doctor's appointments, library, grocery store, well, there's a library and a grocery store right across the street from the school. And so the kids were able to get on this bus that was intended for other purposes, and that was kind of a workaround. And also maybe your funder might allow, you know, you can get creative. Maybe your funder will allow you to provide, you know, small gift cards if your participants have cars or pay for taxis. <clears throat> so creating a safe space, that's really important first and, first and foremost. Obviously, you're coming in talking about a very sensitive topic, and you've got lots of survivors in the room, and you want to right up front create that safe space, because even though you're working for prevention, you are also going to be dealing with, as soon as you start talking about the issue, people really start coming forward and disclosing. And so we did a lot of effort to create safe spaces, and this is just kind of an example where we did a lot of team building activities at the beginning. Like I said, we, we played a lot of games, a kind of getting to know you, but also kind of getting to feel comfortable and feel like we're kind of a team. And it was hard because a lot of the kids were from different social groups, different cliques, and I saw some tension in the room at times, and so it was really important for me to kind of get everyone working together. And you can see here, there, you know, on the left here, we had a lot of really kids that were really into art. So we had kids kind of identify what the values of the group, uh, what they wanted the values to be. 
I know these are hard to read, but basically to give you some examples, they wanted their, their group to be seen in the community as being nice, open-minded, trustworthy, charismatic, responsible, and making an impact. And then I also tried to put pictures up of the group kind of throughout every couple months I would take a picture of the group because the members changed over time and also uh, developed some group agreements. So I'm sure you do that with a lot of your groups, but having the students come up with what the agreements of the group are going to be, how we're going to hold each other accountable. And again, I know those are hard to read. Some of them say step up or step back. Does anyone know it? Has, have you heard of that? Step up or step back is kind of, if you're the type of person in a room, in a group setting, who tends to talk a lot and have a lot of ideas and, and you know, be a, be a leader, you know, challenge yourself sometimes to take a step back and allow some space for other people to talk. And that's really critical in this process. And then if you're the type that doesn't like to talk a lot, you're very introverted, shy, challenge yourself when you have an idea to speak up and to say something. And that proved to be one of the most important ground rules that we kept coming back to in this process. And you know, some of the other ones say, treat others how you want to be treated, respect each other's feelings. It's not always about being right or wrong. Uh, respect when people are talking. Everyone ha has the right to be listened and heard. So that just kind of gives you an example. Every time, one challenge at this school was they were on a term system instead of a semester system. So that's one month term. And so every month, new kids would join the school and some kids would leave the school. There was a, it was a very transient kind of population by the nature of the, the community. And so every term we would review these ground rules and try to attempt to kind of build community, play the games, get to know each other, and always making sure everybody knew each other's name. That is very, very important. Okay, so back to the slide here. Another big challenge for me was training because I, I suggest doing a lot of training up front. I've heard some people in the field like to do a big retreat where they you know, do three intensive days or two intensive days of training. That just didn't really work in this community because I had so many kids come and go. And so I had to really incorporate training throughout the entire process. I don't know in the model why they don't have that as one of the things because I think that's incredibly critical that when you're going to be having them come up with community-based solutions, they have to have some kind of education about the issue in the first place. Otherwise, I feel like it, it very much tends to go sometimes to victim blaming kind of stuff. And so we did uh, a lot of training up front, but then also I really tried to incorporate it throughout the entire school year. And then retention. How do you retain your stakeholders? How do you get them to stay? You have to make it fun. You have to provide food if you can. If your money allows you to buy food, I really suggest it. I had them give me ideas for food. Uh, I bought the food that they liked. We played games at the beginning. Every day we started the, the, the session with a 10 minute kind of icebreaker. And most importantly, stakeholders, as I'm sure if you volunteered on anything in your life, you need to feel like you're actually contributing to something. You actually need to feel like you're actually making some progress, contributing to something greater, and that will make you stay or want to stay. Okay, so identifying root causes. This is where you're going to ask the community the question. The big question is, what kind of sexual violence, what are the types of sexual violence, what are the biggest issues that you see going on in your community? And why do you think those are happening here? What are the root causes? What are the contributing factors to those happening? You'll see on your worksheet, there's kind of a, a little guide that kind of helps guide the process. So I'll ask you, in thinking about the communities that you're working with, I always suggest asking this question many, many, many different ways to get community members to really start thinking about this issue. So what are some other ways that you could ask that? How do you see sexual assault happening in your community? What are some other ways that you could ask a community member that? So one step is to ask the community members, your stakeholders, you know, what is happening here? What are the biggest issues here? What are you most concerned about? What do you see among your peers that concerns you? And as you're having this discussion, a lot of times a group setting is a good way to do that. But you could also have kind of more individual sessions, which I did with some of the kids because I felt like I wasn't hearing from some people. You could also have them do brainstorms on a worksheet like this. So you could have them sit down and do an individual write and have them think about kind of what they think. 
you could also do a survey, which is one thing we did in this school. So the kids said, you know, I don't really know. I don't know what, I don't even know if sexual violence is happening here. How can we get that information? Well, I kind of explained, you know, sexual assault being a, an umbrella term that includes a lot of different things, and they came up with a survey to ask their peers about it. And then how do you get your community members to kind of think about kind of larger social issues? And a lot of times, you know, you might have a lot of kids focus on, uh, you know, one one bad choice. You know, a person just just being dumb or being stupid or being a bad person and making a bad choice to take advantage of another person or to bully another person, harass them, sexually assault them. And I really want to push them to think about, well, where do you think they learned that behavior? That's a way to kind of get them to move to the outer levels of the social ecology. Where do you think they learned that behavior? Is there anything at your school that kind of encourages that kind of behavior or that kind of thinking? Is there anything at, amongst your community members that kind of might lead people to thinking that that's okay in your community. And so in our model, we call this kind of point A. This is point A. These are the, the underlying root causes of sexual violence in a community. And this is just a brainstorm. This is an example of some of the underlying causes that the students came up with. So you can see this is just taken from a poster board of one of our group sessions. And really, this conversation kind of continues throughout. It's not just a one-time conversation. But these are some of the things they identified in their community as being root causes of sexual violence. Another thing that I noticed very quickly right off the bat was that I heard some comments from students, and I started hearing this more and more. A lot of students were saying, well, one of the big issues here, and we, what we found on the survey, was some people felt not totally safe at that school. And what they learned what they thought was that it's actually the newer students at this school that tend to have a lot of problems with acting out and being disrespectful and not acting right. They actually thought it was the newer members of the community. And I said, well, why do you think that is? Why do you think newer members, newer students, that kind of surprised me, actually. Why do you think it's newer students that are acting out and being disrespectful? And they said, well, our, our school is just seen as where all the bad kids go. Everybody in the community talks about our school in such a bad, negative way. Like, this is where all the bad kids go. And then all of a sudden, I started listening more and more in kind of classroom settings like this, and more and more of the kids started saying, oh, yeah, my middle school teacher told me if I kept acting like this, if I, was if I kept being bad, I'd have to go to Two Rivers. Like, it was kind of seen as a punishment to go to this school. And I heard that again and again and again. Students telling me their parents were scared to send them there. One, one kid told me that he had heard that uh, this is where all the the kids from Echo Glen go. So if those of you who are local kind of know, Echo Glen is like the juvenile facility for incarcerated youth, which does happen to be in the same community. They thought this was the school for the kids who were incarcerated, which is not true. There's all these kind of negative myths and stereotypes about the kids who go there. And so I started realizing, I think this might be, you know, a, a theme here that I just keep hearing over and over again. So next, you're going to guide your community members through uh, this envisioning process where you want them to think about what would, your pro what would your program, what would your family, what would your school look like without sexual violence? And you really have to push them to really think about, you know, it's not just they, they would say like, oh, I think survivors would be supported. We're actually talking about what would happen if you actually did not have any sexual violence or sexual harassment or sexual assault in your community. What would it actually look like? And so a lot of that, you know, you, again, back to the worksheet. What would your community look like without sexual violence? And again, you want to try to shift that focus as much as possible to being focused on preventing perpetration because there does tend to be a tendency to go uh, after kind of changing potential victims' behavior. And we want to kind of avoid that and move them toward changing a culture where someone said, you know, everyone is respected and everyone feels safe. And that's what we call condition B in the process. Okay, so here is the poster of, you know, the, what the kids came up with at Two Rivers for what their community would look like if it were truly free from sexual assault. If there were no sexual assault occurring, this is how they would feel. People would always treat each other with respect. It would be peaceful. People would speak up about issues and find solutions. There would be less fear and more happiness, and people would want to come to the school. Okay, so next step is creating your prevention plan. So this is basically how do you get from point A to point B? And I usually put both the posters up, and I say here was the condition A, 
and here's condition B. Now, how are we going to get? How are we going to get there? And so again, on the worksheet, you know, how can we get from point A to point B? But you can also ask them about strategies that will work uh, to eliminate sexual violence in their community. And this is this is kind of more of a really ongoing conversation where we first start with a brainstorm. And then we start talking about kind of what's realistic and what we're going to be able to do and then really working out the details. You really want to create a process to hear all of the voices in the room. And I just noticed really quickly that there were a couple kids that just kept, you know, speaking up and felt really comfortable in a large group. And then I had other students that seemed very anxious, very nervous to say anything. But then all of a sudden when they say something, it was like, wow, you really have thought about this and you have really great ideas. And so I kind of ha kept having to bring up our ground rules about stepping up or stepping back. And then sometimes I would just kind of point blank say, you know, I'm hearing some voices in the room a lot louder than I'm hearing some others. And can we talk about that? And what are some ideas that we can use to hear everybody's voice? And so one thing that the kids actually came up with themselves was whiteboards. So I got, with my grant money, I got individual little whiteboards, dry erase boards, for each student with a bunch of dry erase pens. And those actually ended up being a great tool because the students that didn't feel comfortable speaking in large group, they would be kind of doodling, but they'd also write down these kind of amazingly brilliant things on the whiteboard. And then after class, I would take pictures of each of those. And then I'd go up to the student and say, hey, I noticed you wrote this thing. I, I was really inspired by this. Are you okay if I share that with the group tomorrow? And sometimes they would be and sometimes they wouldn't be. But that was the way that I tried to kind of really make sure that I was hearing from everyone. Also, sometimes you're going to have those, that kind of oppression and biases kind of playing out in the room right there. So that happened many times. Even, even starting with me, you know, I really had to do a lot of work on my own biases and kind of... Uh, internalize adultism <laughs> that you know I I'm the expert here this is what I've studied and this is you know I know what's gonna work and I really had to work on that myself and kind of look at these youth get over my own biases too you know I had my own biases of kids who go to alternative school and I really had to get over that and really be aware of that and check myself uh, especially at the beginning of working with them and so that is important and also sometimes you'll see things playing out like racism, sexism, homophobia in a classroom. So at one point I noticed, you know, the guy is kind of shutting down, not wanting to talk and then all of a sudden, you know, the girls felt really disrespected like they're, they're not even listening to what we're saying. We had to have a pretty open discussion about privilege and how that plays out in different communities and how, you know, this is not about a personal attack on you but if you're trying to be an ally to a marginalized group the first thing you can do is to really show that you're listening, you know, and really, really try to hear people. And we, we talked pretty openly like that. I also had to do a lot of work with my adult colleagues too, the adult stakeholders. They would also kind of go in there and say, okay, I've got a plan. We're going to do this, this, and this. And then we're going to go into this other school and we're going to um, make these posters. And I got, I found this great website and we're going to just basically submit things to this contest. And, you know, all these ideas, where really this was, you know, I had to kept reminding them, and I just used my, my funders <laughs> as my excuse. You know, my funders are really requiring that this is really youth-driven, youth and they're the stakeholders in the project, and they, they really need to drive the process. And so I kind of kept having to remind all of us that we needed to really listen to them as the experts of their community. They know what will work. And by the end, they were just shooting down my ideas like nothing, you know? And then I kind of knew I was successful. They would kind of tell me that my ideals were kind of stupid and silly. And I kind of knew, okay, I'm, I'm being successful because they felt comfortable telling me that's not going to work in my community. So here is another brainstorm how we're going to get from point A to point B and coming up with a prevention plan. And this is also another idea for how to hear all voices in the room is this idea of value voting. How many of you have heard of value voting? Okay, so value voting, my... My instructions for a brainstorm are just to listen. We don't want to put up, we want to write down everybody's idea. We're not going to shoot down ideas. So that's why you even see on here uh, fireworks. Someone wanted to have fireworks at an event, so I wrote that down. Uh, so I write down everybody's idea, and we don't shoot anybody's idea down. Then we're going to kind of later, maybe the next day or a week later, then you're going to discuss about what's really realistic. And we're going to discuss how realistically each one of these things might look. And then we're going to have the kids vote. 
And you could give each student three votes, two votes, or one vote. You can give them each stickers. In this case, I had them just put stars. And they could vote for two different ideas. And then you kind of get an idea of what are the most popular ideas in the group and what we're going to try to do for our prevention plan. <clears throat> Again, here's the whiteboards. I, I really found these to be a great tool, again, because the students came up with this idea themselves, and it ended up helping in a lot of different ways. Another thing that came up was the different clicks in the room. There was one day where I just felt like the one social group versus the other social group, and every idea that this group brought up, the other one would immediately shoot it down. Uh, and then vice versa, they would come up with an idea, and this group would immediately shoot it down. So I said the next day very openly, you know what, I'm just going to be honest. I feel like sometimes people are just kind of arguing for the sake of arguing. And I don't feel like we're moving forward. And so the kids came up with some ideas. And again, the whiteboards came in very handy because they felt like sometimes they just have so many great ideas and they can't, you know, they have to interrupt because they, they have to get it out right away. And I said, well, you know, that's against our ground rules. So why don't we write it on a whiteboard? And, uh, and the students felt like, that would actually help them listen better if they could quickly jot down their idea and then be more present for the speaker. And so that was actually an idea that they came up with and we ended up using it uh, for several years. So here's kind of our project in a nutshell and then I wanna move forward and get you to the actual fun deliverables that they actually created because I did bring examples of these. So one of the con big concerns was that not all of the students felt safe. On the survey, we actually had a small number of kids report that they didn't feel safe but the stakeholders were very concerned about that. They wanted everyone at the school to feel safe. And again, they were thinking that these were more the newer students, and the underlying issue was that this, they had this very negative reputation in the community, and they weren't doing a great job of really reaching out to those newer students. So they decided to create a mentorship program and tell the community about all the positive things happening. The next issue, were from the survey we kind of identified some of the biggest issues at the school as far as what types of sexual assault. So sexual rumor spreading was really big there, sexual comments, jokes and gestures, unwanted flirting, touching, verbal comments about someone's sexual orientation, and online comments about on social media. And so they felt the underlying cause were that these are kind of seen as more acceptable, they're more nuanced forms of sexual assault, and they're not really seen as actually being that serious or being actually a form of sexual assault. And so they decided to host this multimedia event at the school to educate people about this and to change the culture of the school. And then lastly, a lot of students have these attitudes that kind of minimize sexual assault or blame the victim, a lot of kind of adherence to rape myths, and they don't also know how to intervene. So the students felt that the underlying issue was lack of education, and so they decided to create videos to educate people about how to prevent and intervene. And so the, again, the goals would be that everybody feels safe here, people are educated about the issue, and that new students feel welcome, and the community actually talks well about our school. We talked about an evaluation plan, and so how are we gonna know that we were successful? And the students will actually help you do this, the, your, your stakeholders. They will come up with an evaluation plan of how we're gonna know that we made the change we wanted to make. And so if you look back at your goals, that will help your stakeholders come up with different data collection methods to evaluate your program. And you can evaluate each of your initiatives, and then you can also do an overall kind of outcome evaluation as well. And even in this process, you want to really consider those outer levels of the social ecology. So without just measuring individual attitudes and behaviors, is there a way to measure norms change? That's a little bit harder but is there a way to measure school climate, school culture? Uh, in this case, is there a way to measure the way people see your school? Because that's something that they wanted to change. And so we talked about that. And you can see here are lots of different surveys that we ended up coming up with. So we ended up me measuring each individual initiative and then we did an overall. Okay. So carrying out the prevention plan, this is obviously the meat of your project, this is what's gonna take all of the time, but assisting the community in carrying out the plan that they came up with. I like to determine priority activities with not only the value voting, but also you've gotta go back to your stakeholder, sorry, your gatekeepers in your community, in this case the principal. We really gotta run everything by that person and make sure that this is actually going to be feasible and this is actually gonna be utilized 
and people actually are going to get on board with this. We're not going to hit major barriers. We, I like to manage, a, I'm kind of the thread with the work plan, but I like to make sure everybody and this, all the stakeholders are really clear on what they're going to be doing, breaking it up into steps, having little work groups, and really utilizing their strengths. I noticed some of the kids, especially with these events and public speaking, got really, really nervous, and I could just see the anxiety kind of like I felt when I first walked in this room today. Um, you can just see the panic. And so I would often let them, ask them first what they wanted to volunteer for. And a lot of times they wanted to be the photographer or they wanted to help make the posters. And they really did not want to be in the limelight. And that is okay. So I like to kind of make sure that everybody's utilizing their own strength. And, and I always told, I was very, very much based in consent, never going to make you do anything you don't want to do. And I always made that very, very, very clear. And again, a lot of redirection to best practices. So one of the things that kids often want to do, beyond making t-shirts, because they always want to do that, is um, they, you, a lot of the communities I've worked with, middle school and high school students, want to make a video. And I'll show you some of the videos that they made. But a lot of times, they want to act out the actual act of sexual assault. So they want to act out the harassment or the bullying incident. And they're very, very strong on that idea. I've noticed that as kind of a theme. And so I kind of had to share with them, uh, you know, veering them to maybe another idea. And you'll see in these videos, there's, there's still some portrayal of the issue, which is good. But we don't want to be triggering uh, to survivors. And we also really want to remember the focus of this is prevention. So we really want to give kids an idea of how to intervene if that happens, and then how could it have been prevented in the first place? really guiding them toward what research shows and what the best practices are. Okay, so now we're getting into the fun deliverables that the kids actually created. And so this was in year one. As I stated before, the students had the idea to come up with a mentorship program. And this was a way to reach out better to newer students coming in. And they felt that a lot of times, as when they started at the school, they were very nervous because they had heard that this is where all the bad kids go. Uh, one kid said he had heard um, the, the triple D or something. This is where all the delinquents, druggies, and dropouts go. And so how do you feel on the first day walking into this school? You feel nervous. And another student, I think, summed it up best. I think this sums up the school pretty well. Everyone in the community thinks that we're all the juvenile offenders, and really we are all the victims. And so I thought, wow, that's really poignant, and that sums it up. And so how do you feel when you first go there? Because you don't really realize that truly this is a very respectful school and this is that such a small kind of family like homey environment but you wouldn't know that as an outsider hearing all these horrible things and so they created this mentorship program they wanted to call themselves the gurus so here are the gurus uh, they wanted to be the upperclassmen who reached out to the newer students and so as I said another underlying issue in this community was you could have a student start the school brand new any month because they were on a one month term instead of like normal schools where it's a semester system. And so usually you'd have a child join it, usually at the start of the school year, but maybe at mid semester. In this school, every month, new cohort of kids coming in. And so we need to reach out better to those students. And so each month there's an orientation and the gurus, they would go in there and they would play games and they would be really friendly and they would make sure that they knew each other's names. They created this beautiful PowerPoint which, where each guru had their own slide and said, you know, this is, I'm really into, I, you know, I'm a twin. I uh, love traveling. I'm really into, uh, you know, whatever the activity is. I'm really into ice skating or, you know, I'm really, I really love this school and I'm really excited to be your mentor. And they wrote all these kind of inspirational quotes and had pictures of themselves so the newer students could feel like they got to know them. And then the students, the newer students got to choose their top three choices for who their mentor would be. And then they were assigned a mentor. And it was based on kind of one student wanted to be like the big brother, big sister program. She said, I always wanted a big brother, a big sister, and I think that would work really well here. And then they would be kind of like, we would adopt them as like our little brother, our little sister. And this again came completely from the students. I, I would have no idea that this is what we were going to end up doing. 
And this, of course, ended up being a, a big process because each month we had to come up with these presentations and the matching and making sure that they stayed connected. That was another challenge. The students next wanted to make a documentary about their school and they wanted to provide a view of a day in the life of a student and what their school felt like when you walked in the door. So they want to have GoPro cameras where you walked in the school and you got to see what the school looked like. And then they wanted to have candid, unscripted interviews with students and staff talking about what the school was like to reset some of the social norms and the community perspective of the school. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. It's not what everybody anticipates it to be. You know, coursework is actually pretty fast-paced and you have to put in a lot of effort. I learned so much from the staff here. The students. I figured out what I want to do for a career in the future. I've presented at a youth conference for Be The Change. Um, I've helped get new classes started for the school. Even in cooking, we've made stuff for the homeless shelters. The academic expectations at Two Rivers are different in that we don't get grades. We work on a standards-based system. It's like a good opportunity to actually customize your education. I like the teachers the most. They're very optimistic. They're very encouraging. I chose to come to Two Rivers because of smaller class sizes. It's more individual. Like If you have a question, the teacher can actually make time to talk to you about it. Other schools focus a lot on rules and regulations and how to get stuff done. Here, because of our small size, we're able to give each student what they need at that moment. I like how small the classes are, it's easy to work. Not just another face in the crowd. The teachers really help you do your work, and they like help you get through the terms. I can talk to teachers one-on-one -on -one and actually get my questions answered. They know my name. I'm not just another student number to a school. I'm an actual person, and it feels great. They completely understand me. I felt that. I like the atmosphere at Two Rivers, you know, it's, it's a comfortable place. Everyone respects each other, the teachers respect all the students, and the students respect all the teachers. People treat each other with respect. They all respect each other. Here people treat each other with a lot more respect and decency. I think the students are great. Um, everybody always has a positive attitude, so everybody pitches in and makes everybody happy. It's really easy to like just know everyone here, so it's like there's a lot of respect shown. There's a lot of respect among the students and teachers. Before I started going here, I heard that uh, Two Rivers was just for kids who got in trouble at other schools, but uh, when I got here, it was, it was really different. Because of its reputation, there's a lot of students who have benefited greatly from this school who may not want to come because they think there are certain things happening here that are actually really nice to each other compared to you know traditional high school it's just a really homey community and like no one around here picks on anybody no one really bullies each other there's really not much bullying all the kids really understand each other and are coming from the same kind of place i love the whole homey environment i love that everyone can get along because everyone's different but everyone can have something it's, it's like a community versus a, a school. It's, it's very welcoming and I enjoy it. Um, I think that's one of the best things about an alternative school and a smaller school is how students treat one another as well as how staff and students interact together. I chose to come to Two Rivers because other schools weren't really working out for me and then I came here and the teachers were actually caring and considerate and accepting. If it wasn't for Two Rivers, I would not be in school. It's a sanctuary, I think. I'm about to graduate. I'm really glad I came here. Pick me up off the cold, wet ground. I'm tired of.
I'm going to tell them that you clap for them. <laughs> they were so excited that I was presenting on their project at this conference, so I will definitely tell them that. Okay, so, you know, just a couple things to share about that video. Um, you can see that, again, the attempt was to change the social norms of the community and the way that people thought about this school. There was also kind of a widespread plan to really share this with people and just post it all over social media. It ended up going on the school district website on their main homepage of the whole district, and then also went on the school's individual website. Uh, we... Uh, made a specific effort to reach out to other principals and to middle school counselors because they are often the gatekeeper of where you're going to go to high school. And a student that may be struggling in a mainstream middle school, you know, should be offered this school as an option. And they should not be told, this is where all the bad kids go and if you keep screwing up, you're gonna go here, we're gonna send you here. But this is a choice, this is a school of choice and this might be a good fit for you. Um, and here's a video to educate you about what the school is like. Another thing that you notice, our intention was to talk about the social norms and the way people treat each other. The principal really asked us if we could also address the other big stereotype about the school, which were the academics. And so you can see the beginning of the school talked about, it's actually pretty rigorous here, the teachers really help you here, um, they help you move through the terms, you can customize your education. One girl said that. She was actually one of the students that did Running Start, ended up going to community college and getting her AA degree in addition to her high school diploma at the same time. So you can really customize how you, how you go through high school at the school. And the principal wanted that to be addressed in the movie. And even though I felt that that was beyond what I was trying to do, uh, I felt it was important to include that because she is a major gatekeeper. She's going to show this to all of her colleagues. She's going to share this with all the other principals. And if she feels like it's valuable to undo both of those negative stereotypes, we wanted to support her. And the kids also really agreed with that too. They wanted to undo that negative stereotype about this is where all the um, special needs kids go and the kids who um, aren't very smart and this is just an easy class. I mean, you don't have to do anything to get a, to get a grade here. And that's just not true. Um, it's actually pretty accelerated. So that's why the, the movie addresses both. This was a poster campaign that the students also came up with to start off the school year. Th this was the first year. This was, this was year two. Actually, this was year th three. And this was the first time I got to work with students before the first day of school. And I really capitalized on that and said, okay, th we have an opportunity to, to do something for the first week of school and really reach out to those new students and really kind of help them learn what the school is like. And they said, well, let's do a poster campaign that's all over when you first walk in that tells them about what we're like at this school. And so you can see here, can you read that? Okay, you can see, you know, the, the, the poster series was Two Rivers Is, and then fill in the blank, and they interviewed all of their friends, and they had the words that they would use to describe this school. They also made little welcome bags with little inspirational quotes and gave those out as kids walked in on the first day of school, and it just had like a couple pens, pencils, candy, and then uh, just like fun little quotes about welcome to Two Rivers, we're so glad you're here, let's make it a great year. And um, so that was actually something that's really easy to implement that we only did in about two weeks. Um, at that first orientation. This was that multimedia event that I was telling you about. This was on year two, and the kids came up, uh, capitalized on our statewide coalition's theme, which was called Be the Solution, and they had a lot of great materials already at our state coalition, and so the kids really, really liked that theme as a theme for their event. And so because the kids identified a lot of kids as being kind of the the artsy type, kids that are really into like movies and media and music and poetry they want, and art, they wanted to do a multimedia event. So they solicited uh, submissions from classmates on kids that wanted to perform or submit artwork for this event. And I'll just share with you some of the art. So this was hung up around the school. These were submitted uh, in advance, we screened everything in advance, and then we were able to hang it up for the event. And the best thing was, is that no one thought to take them down afterwards. So even a year later, those were still up. And I think that was great. We had kids perform poetry, uh, speeches. We had a couple kids make videos. We also had the kids just share some of their favorite YouTube videos that we thought were wonderful. Um, and again, the posters, the art, uh, several announcements. 
that, that went on for the entire school. This was uh, one of the kids made a consent flow chart, which I just thought was absolutely brilliant. She kind of got panicked at the end because she wanted to make it into a video, and it was the day before. I said, you know, I don't think you really have time to do a video, but maybe you could write the things down, and we could kind of display it visually. So she was ready to just kind of give up. But then when I saw what she had written, I just thought, this is brilliant. You know, we have, you have to do something with this. And so she decided to do this flow chart that was then up the entire year, and then it got moved into the health class room. So it's actually still up there. And... I don't know if you can read about the top. It has different ways to ask someone for consent. So are you okay with this? What do you want to do? Is this okay? Hey, let's do this. And then a flow chart. If the person tells you no, then you should say, that's fine. I, don't, I wouldn't want to make you feel uncomfortable. Don't worry about it. That's okay. I will respect your boundaries. Oh, okay. And then if someone tells you yes, that is what consent is. It's respecting the answer, respecting someone's boundaries. It's mandatory. So in year three, this was another deliverable that the kids came up with, and this actually started with an idea from the principal who said, you know, we have to do this mandatory harassment, intimidation, and bullying education. It's required by our district, probably required statewide. I don't know, do all of your states require that kind of thing? Okay, so this is a state uh, law, and the district has to provide some kind of education about their, their individual policy when it comes to harassment, intimidation, and bullying. And the principal said, you know, I want to do something where, you know, we educate students in a way that they'll actually, you know, kind of, it will be relevant to them. And the kids said, well, what are you doing now? And she showed them their PowerPoint, and the kids just said, you know, there's no way you can do a PowerPoint. We want to make videos. And so this was kind of some of the process of them creating these videos. It ended up being five YouTube videos. I thought it was just going to be one. And they just couldn't agree on a scenario. They wanted to do all the different scenarios and then how you could intervene and then how you could prevent each type of sexual assault or, or harassment, intimidation, and bullying. And so I'm going to share, with, share those videos with you. There's actually five total, but I'm only going to share two for the sake of time. So there's the five total. They also ended up developing a curriculum that goes with this. There's actually a lesson plan, and this was presented at the entire school, again, for another all-school event. And those are free online, and I'll share that link with you. So this one's called Pants. It all started in math class one day with a pair of jeans worn by Ricky. He had a different style, just like everyone else. Ricky liked to sag his jeans. Another student, Melissa, didn't like that. So she made a comment, and a boy who liked her, Jeremy, overheard. The next day in math class, Melissa noticed Ricky was sagging his jeans again. Ooh, what a thug, Melissa said loudly. Jeremy heard her and got an idea of how to impress her. He ran up to Ricky, who was standing by the door, and pulled down his sagging pants. Colette, another girl in the class, was on her phone and quickly snapped a picture of the incident. Everyone laughed at Ricky, and he hurried to pull his pants back up, embarrassed. He ran out of the classroom. Later that night, Melissa and Jeremy set up a group chat with Colette. They tried to convince her to post the photo she took online. Colette looked at the picture on her phone, unsure of what to do. She decided to text Ricky and ask if he was okay with her posting the picture. Ricky responded, No. Okay. This whole situation could have been prevented if Melissa and Jeremy had acted differently, if Melissa hadn't been so judgmental and made rude comments, and if Jeremy hadn't responded by pantsing Ricky. Every harassment situation is preventable if the bully simply chooses not to bully, and everyone should always get consent, even for the little things like posting a picture online. Here's the next one, Rumor Wildfire. Hey, did you hear about that party last night? Yeah, man, I heard it was crazy. I wish I had gone, I heard it was really crowded. Hey guys, what's up? Bro, nothing much. Didn't you go to that party? Haha, <laughs> yeah. Ooh, what, what happened? happened? I had a great time with Anita. We hung out all night. 
Anita and Drake. <laughs> what? Guys, come listen to this. <laughs> Wow, yeah, Anita. Yeah, go, so yeah. What did you do? Tell me more. How was it? Wait, uh, wow, Anita must be girl. easy. I didn't know Anita yes, was that type crazy. of girl. You're a now. <laughs> oh, look, it's Anita. <laughs> What's going on? Mom, come pick me up. What's wrong? Everyone heard I went to the party with Drake. Wow, Anita did was last easy. Night. I didn't oh, know Anita was a pet girl. girl. You're wow. real. Hey, now. hey, Way stop. stop. Like this isn't fair to Anita. If Anita and Drake did anything at that party, it's nobody's business. Just because Anita is a girl doesn't mean she's a bad person for being intimate with people. That's her business, and people should not judge her for it. Anita is a person with feelings, and she left school crying today because of this. Spreading rumors about someone is a form of harassment. Spreading rumors about someone's sexual history is a form of sexual harassment. Whether or not there is truth to these rumors, they are still a violation of students' legal rights. We need to think twice before passing on a rumor. Sometimes it's tempting to tell a friend a juicy piece of gossip, but think about how being part of a rumor wildfire can really hurt people. Why do we make so many assumptions and judgments of people? Why are we so tempted to get involved with people's personal lives? Why can't we just respect people's privacy? Furthermore, why are girls and boys not treated with equal respect for choices they make in their personal life? In our culture, the standards for men and women are not very practical or fair. These double standards for guys and girls are all based on harmful gender stereotypes and expectations. Let's change this and avoid these types of comments and gossip. What's the point of spreading the fire? Why not put it out? Also, we did commute. We did uh, contract with a, a media expert. Uh, who I felt I really needed help on because I'm not a media expert and I don't know a lot about creating media. And that original intention, the original idea was the kids wanted to actually act out scenarios and with actual them, them actually doing the acting. And so this media expert came in and she kind of educated them about other ways to portray an idea without actually acting it out since we don't, you know, maybe have a lot of training with acting. <laughs> and so these were some of the I ideas that they came up with, paper cutouts, whiteboard. We, there's also one that's claymation. Uh, so you can find those online and I'll, I'll share those with you. Okay, how are you going to evaluate your, your project? So you want to engage stakeholders in this process. I mean, some of this is going to be guided by you and your funders and how you're going to evaluate, but some of this can also be led by the stakeholders. And so I'll just give you an example of how to evaluate and revise. You know, the guru program that I was talking about with the mentorship, what, we got some feedback from mentees. A couple people said, um, I saw my guru a couple times and then they just disappeared. And we realized that our gurus, who were the leadership students, had actually graduated. You know, some of them had actually left after term two or term three because they graduated. And we didn't really account for that. And then we do have a couple people who dropped out. And so we need to assign each student two mentors. So then after that, the student said, well, let's assign every new student two mentors. So in case one graduates or drops out, they'll still have the other mentor still at school. And they also decided to present themselves as all as a group, we are all here for you. So students would always have kind of a group of kids that they could go to if they had a problem. Uh, we also want to facilitate the shift in ownership, and this is something I'll just kind of tell you what I have learned about how to shift the ownership, because all of a sudden, your grant's going to come to an end, and you're not going to be working in that community anymore. And so, unless you're, you know, a member of that community, maybe you will continue. But some of the things that I've found that kind of help it live on are how to find natural fits for that uh, initiative within where it's, things are already kind of happening similarly in the school. So, for example, um, that harassment, intimidation, and bullying policy is a legal requirement that you have to do with all students every year. So now they're going to be able to show those videos and use their lesson plan every single year. In fact, I just got a text from the teacher before I started here. She said, you know, good luck. And she said, I just want to let you know the students are this morning presenting that same presentation to the new group of students starting this week. So it's going to live on for years. And it's very easily replicated. That's another thing. Do things that are kind of low cost, very easy to replicate, because that's going to set your community up for success to actually uh, keep things going, to make it more sustainable. Also, if you're working with youth, work with the younger grades, not just the seniors. 
work with the freshmen and you know the, the sophomores they're the future generation of the school and they will also help carry it on and then invite outside community members to all of your events we had school board members show up to that event and then they said well my son goes to this middle school and I want this in my son's middle school so school board member then went to the principal of the middle school and said I want these videos for all the school here and so invite people and post everything on social media and then slowly as you phase out of your project you know I'm lucky enough with my job that I'm still able to go back to the school and provide some technical assistance like maybe I could go out there once a month now instead of what I was there before twice a week okay and the last is really important is to celebrate your successes after each initiative each each video was completed each event we had a party you have to have a party after each thing and then at the very end of the three-year project there was a school carnival on the last day of school and we used that as an opportunity to really honor the stakeholders and we provided a rose and a certificate and a, as a ceremony for everyone's contribution we also had a creative way to share data and again I was so glad because the superintendent of the entire school district showed up to this event because we were also honoring a retiring teacher and so we displayed re results so I only have a couple minutes I'm gonna quickly go through outcomes and evaluation and then I'm happy to stay afterwards for questions and I apologize I'm running a little behind so the process implementation is basically looking at kind of the, your processes and how it's going kind of like the guru program example outcomes are kind of the overall project what did you accomplish and did were you successful at what you set out to do we did an all-school survey and measured dosage so how many of you saw this video how many of you went to this event how many of you saw our posters and we got a percentage of students who actually uh, had exposure to our different initiatives we also surveyed the students every student at the school not just the stakeholders how would you have described two rivers before you came here this is a wordle does everybody know what a wordle is it's a thing where you can actually show um, visually so the larger font is the, the more common of an answer so this is the prevalence you know the, the, the most prevalent comment was I saw this as being a school with drug and alcohol problems and bad kids how do you see the school now these were the responses so the biggest responses are nice teachers welcoming nice students supportive friendly so you can see that shift these were some statements that we asked on a pre survey and a post survey 2012 to 2015 these are items where you'd want people in general you'd want them to agree with that statement so I looked at how many strongly agreed in 2012 and then how many strongly agreed in 2015 at the end of the project and you can see a pretty significant increase with some of these measures and the star one is actually st statistically significant change and again these are items where you generally want people to disagree with the statement and so you can see that the percentage who strongly disagreed compared to the percentage who strongly disagreed three years later and you can see a pretty significant uh, change in many of these items and some items we saw no change but these are the ones where we saw the most change okay and lastly we really wanted to measure the community's perception of the school and so we sent out our serve an online survey to community members and we got school board members to actually complete this district staff staff at other schools principals at other schools parents employers and social service providers we had 74 people total fill it out and we asked them how would you have described two rivers three years ago and you can see again the most common responses were dropouts lazy students and drug and alcohol problems how would you describe two rivers now resilient students supportive nice teachers welcoming so I think a wordle is kind of a fun way to display your data we also asked the community members how has your perception changed so one person said it used to be a horrible alternative school filled with bad seeds that is not the case two rivers is an exceptional school with great kids and then we also asked them why did your perception change so if your perception changed why did it change and someone said I watched the video on Wildcat TV so that welcome to two rivers documentary was actually shown at the at the video announcements for Mount Si High School which is that very large alternative I don't know how it even got to that but someone showed it so several thousand students at Mount Si High School got to see it so that's what Wildcat TV is uh, I met the building principal know some of the teachers and I've spoken to the students so we got an idea of why their perception changed for the positive 
Okay, lastly, this is my analogy for leaving the nest. <laughs> so as your project's coming to an end, you're wrapping things up, and it was really hard. I mean, I just, this was one of the funnest things I've ever gotten to do. So it was really hard to say goodbye to these kids, and, uh, but to also really, really hope that some of the initiatives would continue. And so uh, we, we also, I just really want to mention really quickly, there were other really great outcomes that I thought were also really significant to mention. Like we actually in our, in our leadership class had the highest attendance of the, compared to every other class at the school. They also had the highest enrollment in 10 years at the school for the first time this year. Um, there was also a lot more decision making stu for students involved with decision making, like the principal then invited them to speak at school board meetings and to do an interview for the new counselor position. And so a lot of these things you saw will continue. Welcome to Two Rivers video, the guru program, all of those will continue. And so I think a lot of that has to be kind of a conscious decision of planning things that will actually be sustainable and be able to carry on. Um, with relatively, you know, less support because you, your prevention staff will not be there anymore. And uh, just a little bit more about me, I've now uh, been awarded a new grant where I'm going to be doing this project in a much different community. So now I'm going to be at a very, very large urban high school. <laughs> so it's going to be a big shift from this project uh, in downtown, or basically central Seattle with 1,600 students. Very, very different environment, as well as working with the school district, a very large school district, and kind of policy changes. So that will to, that's to be t continued. I will let you know how the community development process works in that community. And I want to stay after for questions. So if you want to come on up or just stay, I'll just continue to take questions. But for those of you, I want to respect your time because it is pretty much 12:15. Here are some websites for you with those links to the videos, and here's my contact information. Thank you so much for attending today.